Um, so um, this is an outline of what the lecture is going to cover this uh, in this uh, class. So basically, we have three groups of theories. Okay, the classical politeness theories that we're going to see first. Then we're going to see the second wave theories, uh, which are essentially a criticism of the first wave, uh, the classical politeness theories. And then the third wave theories, it gets a little bit complicated because they basically, is kind of like a reaction to the criticism that uh, sort of goes back to the classical theories, but in a different, uh, in a different perspective. So, so um, you will see it's a fairly, fairly interesting, um, uh, complicated relationship uh, there. All right, so um, first of all, let's be very, very clear um, that we're going to deal with linguistic politeness, right? And uh, there, that's not the same thing as politeness in general, right? Uh, because there's all sorts of activities that are polite, but non-linguistic, okay? So think of opening doors and letting people go in, okay? Um, you know, or letting people go first, etc. And and you know, so all of these things are gestures of politeness that you do to be nice uh, to people, or things like table manners, right, where you put the fork and the knife and the, the spoon, and that, or you know, the fact that you're not supposed to sneeze, you're supposed to cover your your mouth, etc. Okay, so all of these things are part of politeness, but we're not going to be talking about them except as a side uh, as a side note. So what we are talking about is um, uh, linguistic politeness, okay? Now, the other thing that you need to, to um, uh, also remember is that um, there is a folk concept of politeness, which is what people say is polite, right? So when, when you ask people and say, you know, was this behavior polite? They will say yes or no, right? And then there is the scientific <clears throat> definition of politeness that uh, anthropologists or linguists or, or sociologists uh, are, are, are going to give and that the two don't necessarily have to agree, right? I mean, they, they, can, be, they can be different. Except, of course, that folk theories of politeness influence scientific theories, even if the scientists are trying very hard not to be uh, influenced, still the, the influence is there, right? So we need to acknowledge this. All right. So let's look at the classical uh, theories of politeness. First of all, um, we need to say that um, they all, the classical theories, in, in smaller or greater uh, uh, amount, but, but by and large, they're all directly influenced by Grice's idea of the cooperative principle. They all quote it and to um, a large extent use it. Uh, so they're all maxim-based, and, and this is the most important thing, they implicitly, in some cases, explicitly in others, well, as we'll see, they assume a rational speaker, okay? So basically, they are rational theories of politeness. They're theories of politeness that says it is rational to be polite, okay? So, and that's a crucial uh, uh, thing. Um, you know, so, so the first uh, uh, theory in chronological uh, uh, order is Robin Lakos, who in 1973 published a, a little, a short article, well, an article, uh, a long article that became a short book. Um, uh, sorry, no, uh, confused. Um, published an article in 1973 um, that explicitly is based on the principle of cooperation and says, um, you know, you have uh, the in injunction, the principle of cooperation, to be clear. It's part of the maximal manner. And he says, well, there is a, a, another maxim, which is be polite. And uh, politeness wins over clarity. In other words, um, being polite means being unclear on purpose. Okay? And uh, the, um, the, um, it's more important to be polite than to be clear. Right? So if you have to equivocate, that's a good thing. And then she says the, the, the maximal politeness, the principle of politeness, um, then breaks down into uh, three uh, sub-maxims. Don't impose, in other words, avoid imposing on the, on the hearer. 
give the hearer options, give them an, an opportunity to to do whatever they they want. In other words, give them choices, and make the hearer feel good. Okay. So so the standard example, it's a it's a stereotype, right? Uh, uh, in, in numerous jokes, um, you know, the wife goes to her husband. She's got a pair of pants on and said, do these pants make me look fat, right? So let's assume for the sake of, of the argument here that indeed they do, right? Um, you know, obviously you don't want to say, yes, they make you look fat. So you have to be polite, right? And so you say, um, these pants are not uh, the most uh, flattering uh, the garment that I've ever seen, right? Or the designer of these pants should be short. Okay, something like that, right? So, which is far less clear than to say, yeah, they make you look real fat, right? But of course, you can't say they make you look real fat because that's impolite, right? And so then you have to say something, something unclear but polite, okay? And so in this case, you're trying to make the, spe the, the hearer feel good, right? That is, you're saying, um, you know, uh, it's not the pants, it's not you, it's the pants, Right, and, and so you're saying, you know, throw these pants away, they're, they're, they're terrible, okay? Uh, the same thing goes, uh, you know, when somebody says, would you read my poetry? And then I say, what did you think? So oh, it was interesting, you know? So that's a polite way of saying it was horrible, right? So, but you can't say these, these things. Um, you know, uh, don't impose is, is a, more like um, if you, you know, if you have to say, you know, could you drive me to Dallas tomorrow? you know, we live about an hour away from Dallas, that's a big imposition, right? It's a two hour drive and, and so on, and one way, you know, back. So, so to be polite, you, you're not supposed to ask, um, you know, drive me to Dallas, right? So, but you can say, would you mind driving me to Dallas? So you're no longer imposing because if the other person says, no, I love driving, I, I, you know, I, I drive for fun, then, you know, then it's not an imposition. So, so that's the idea, and as you can see, very strong influence from the principle of cooperation, um, except this idea that the, the maxim of politeness is stronger than the maxim of clarity, right? Some maxim. All right, so another, um, another uh, of these uh, Gricean uh, rational uh, models is uh, um, uh, what was um, uh, proposed by Leach, uh, who um, also comes up uh, with a politeness maxim. But he has like six um, maxims, which you see listed there. Tag, generosity, approbation, modesty, agreement, sympathy. Um, you know, and of course they're in pairs, which means that you could easily break it down, sort of take it back to three. And generally speaking, this is Grice's problem, is that uh, he has like a lot of maxims and principles. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he's got a total of like 10 or so. Uh, it, it will be in the chapter of the book when I, when I upload it. Uh, you know, so you can, you can check that. But he's got a lot. And people have made fun of him and have basically rejected his uh, proposal because of this extravagant uh, proliferation of the number of maxims. Um, you know, why is that a problem to have a lot of maxims? Because, because in, in research, you're supposed to, to be very parsimonious with your theoretical uh, inventions. So if you come up with a new maxim, a new principle, each time that you find a regularity, then the explanatory power of your principles is very low. Instead, if you have one big principle like relevance or rationality, that does everything, then your theory is, is much better because the, the explanatory power is much higher, right? So then because of this, then Leach's uh, theory was not well uh, received. But again, you see the strong influence of Grice, uh, this idea of um, uh, a maximal politeness that exists uh, uh, at the same level than the principle of cooperation. That brings us to Brown and Levinson, uh, who uh, in 1978 published a long article that then became a book. That's what I, I got confused before. Um, and uh, this is the cover of the book, by the way. Um, and uh, they proposed the, the one theory of politeness that really took off 
and uh, you know it, it really became sort of the standard explanation of politeness and to this day people will talk in terms of face and so on and so forth and, and it all comes from from Brown and, and Levinson. Now Brown and Levinson borrowed from Goffman uh, who is a uh, an anthropologist uh, uh, the idea of face um, and face means as you see from the quotes there, the image of the self uh, that the, a person has, okay? It's got nothing to do with your face as the, 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 the thing that's on top of your, of your uh, body, okay? Uh, and so the idea is that you have face, you lose face, you maintain face, you may damage your face. And again, it's got nothing to do with your physical face, but it is the social image of yourself that you project onto uh, uh, other people. Um, so what Brown and Levinson say is that uh, face work, which is whatever you do in conversation to maintain your face or, or establish your face or build it up, is rational. Okay, so in, in, and in this sense, they very explicitly uh, say that um, you know uh, they're inspired by uh, by Gricean uh, rationality, the means to an end uh, analysis of the of the situation. Okay, so here uh, I sort of reiterate the fact: face is not sorry, is not facial expression. It's got to do with um, uh, you know the social uh, image uh, of of the self that you that you project. So, Brown and Levinson introduced the idea of positive and negative face. So, positive face is basically, um, you know, building one's ego, building one's image, right? Uh, it's wanting to be liked, okay? It's, it's um, wanting to be admired, to be approved of, to be recognized. When people give you an award for, you know, best, uh, I don't know, uh, best sausage eater of the of the party. All right, then 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 you're like, all right, yeah, then I showed that, right? And so so you feel good, and and that's that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. So how do you tend to positive face? You compliment people. You tell them how good they are, how smart they are, how clever they are. You show interest, right? You ask about their kids. You ask about their work. You ask about their spouse. You know that that kind of. Uh, that kind of thing, and you give them small small gifts. Now, this doesn't mean you bring a cake, okay? although, I mean, feel free to show up in my office with cake any day. I mean, let's be very clear about that. Or okay, you can also send them in the mail, that also works. I'm joking, by the way. Actually, okay, so true story. One time, two of my, I, I used to make this joke all the time, two students showed up at my office with the cake, <laughs> a big one. And they left it because I, I by, by coincidence, wasn't there. So they left the cake. And when I arrived, the secretary of the department goes, here, Dr. Attard, punk, and gives this cake. So I cut it up and went around the department and everybody had cake. And uh, uh, everybody said that I was an excellent teacher. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, um, so small gifts like, uh, you know, helping people out, uh, um, you know, giving them something if they need it. Uh, uh, giving them, um, uh, I don't know, a pen if they forgot to bring the pen. That kind of that kind of thing. Being, basically, being being nice uh, to to people. Um, you know, so so you want to make people feel good. That's positive face. Negative face is, on the other hand, um, basically the desire and the and the the right not to be imposed on. Right? So not to have somebody ask you to do something you don't want to do or somebody come and bother you, or somebody come and tells you what you have to do at the point in time where you don't want to do it, okay? Um, you know, so how do you, when you have to bother people, when you have to disturb people, like for example, you need to come through and they're sitting there, right? So you have to have them get up, but that's an imposition on their negative face. They don't want to get up, right? Or if someone knocks at the door, you have to go answer the door, right? So all of these things, so in order to, um, you know, uh, ward off these, uh, these, these problems of, of um, uh, you know, impinging on someone's negative face, you apologize to them. You say, I'm sorry to have to ask you to get up, 
but I need to go through, right? And so, so then they get up because you are sorry or you show deference. Um, you know, so for example, yesterday a student emailed me and said, dear Dr. Atardo, I know you're very busy and you probably don't have time to talk to me. I'm like, dude, you're paying for the class like everybody else. Of course I have time to talk to you, right? But so, so my point is he's showing deference, right? He's saying you're such an important person, truly you don't have, you don't have time to talk to a lowly student. But of course, I do have time. That's, that's the, my reason for being here, right? Or if you have to ask somebody for something, you offer a way out. So you say, would you mind? And so, of course, the person can say, yes, I do mind, so I'm not going to do it. But of course, we all know that, that you, don't, you don't do that, okay? So then that's positive and negative phase. Um, and uh, so, so Brian and Levinson introduced the idea of face-threatening act, which is basically when you have to do something that's going to lower your face, either positive or negative, right? So a face-threatening act is an action that causes damage to the face of the speaker, okay? So if I ask you for something, then it's, an, it's a face-threatening act because it's an imposition on you, right? So if I say, uh, you know, uh, Jamie, next, uh, next week, please bring a chocolate cake, you know, Jamie goes, oh, crap, now I have to go bake a cake or I have to buy a cake and then I have to put it in a box and carry it to, to commerce. It's a problem, right? So it's an imposition on your time, your energy, your money, because you would have, if you have to buy it. So it's an imposition, right? It's a, it's a pain, right? That's, that's, what, that's what we say, right? So, so then Jamie says, and I'm sorry that I'm using you as an example, but you know, there you are. Uh, Jamie says, uh, well, no. I don't want to bring a cake. So she says, screw you, Dr. Atardo, I'm not bringing any cake. Oh, wait, you can't do that because now my positive face has been damaged in a major way, right? Because I was hoping for cake and you know, my hopes have been dashed, right? So, so that's a problem because now you've damaged my face, right? So, so it's a very big problem because on the one hand, you don't want to have to go out of your way and bake the cake and so on and so forth, which is a big trouble. But if you deny my request, then it's big trouble too, because now you've damaged my face and I'm going to be upset and uh, blah, blah, blah. Right? So it's kind of a lose-lose situation when you're in a face-threatening act uh, situation like this. Right? So, so because of this, we have to provide means for the hearer to be allowed to refuse without damage, okay? And that's where politeness kicks in, right? So basically, Brown and Levinson see politeness as mitigation, okay? In other words, you minimize the risk of the face threat, threat so that basically they see politeness as a face-saving mechanism, okay? You, you save the face of your hearer or your own face by mitigating the face, threaten, the, the, the face threatening act, okay? That is the, the part of the action that threatens the face, you mitigate that. And that goes both ways, okay? Um, so you can have um, uh, the negative FTA, so orders, reminders, uh, that kind of thing, you know, it's a, it's a face threatening, uh, threatening act. Uh, so that's when you say things like, would you mind uh, bringing a cake? Okay, or, or uh, you know, uh, I hope you've been doing your homework along, but remember that I will grade the homework next week, right? And so that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, when, when your, your negative face uh, has been damaged, one way of, of fixing the problem is accepting, right? So if someone says, you know, will you come uh, tomorrow and help me mow the lawn? Uh, you say sure, no problem, right? And so then, then you're you're because you're you're basically saying, oh, it wasn't a problem that uh, that I uh, was imposed upon. I love uh, mowing the lawn, right? And so you accept the the offer. Um, you know, so so then insults or or negative assessments, right? If somebody says, well, Sal, you're no good at uh, singing, right? Which I'm not. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm no good. It's true that I'm no good, right? 
So if somebody says that, of course, it's damage to to my um, to my uh, um, uh, positive face because I you know, would want to be well known for my beautiful uh, singing voice. So so how would you mitigate that? You would say, I'm sorry to have to give you the the news, Sal, but you know you didn't make the audition. Sorry, your singing just isn't uh, what we're looking for, right? And so you you say instead of saying you suck at singing, you say, well, your singing just is not what we're looking for, right? Um, a standard thing, again, it's a stereotype, but the, it's not you, it's not me, it's, no, it's not you, it's me, right? When you're dumping a boyfriend or girlfriend that you no longer fancy or whatever, you don't say, look, you're, you're a sorry you excuse for a human being. You say, oh, I'm so sorry, it's me, I am broken up inside, I cannot form good relationship, I, I, I have to get out of this relationship. Sorry, it's my fault, right? Because basically you let them off without telling them that they're a terrible uh, human being. Um, I wish my wife had heard about this before we got, no, sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking, that's, that's a joke. Um, you know, and then, and then the, the damage to the, to the speaker is when you hurt your own face and then you apologize, you say, oh, I'm sorry that I did this, right? All right, so, um, so Brown and Levinson said, okay, so these are, are politeness is mitigation. How do you go about doing this, right? So, so these are the ways that you can go ahead and, uh, and mitigate, uh, um, and mitigate a uh, face-threatening act. So the, 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 the least mitigated is to do it bold on record, where you just go ahead and do it, okay? So you say, um, you know, don't eat the soup. It's, uh, you know, highly poisonous because, you know, it's a terrible soup. It's, it's full of, uh, uh, you know, the mushrooms are poisonous. You, you suck at the uh, uh, mycology. You pick the poisonous mushrooms. Don't eat them, right? Um, yes, it's impolite. It's rude. But the situation in... You know, you you if they eat it, they're gonna die, right? So so you have to tell them the truth and and uh, say sorry. You're you're a terrible mycologist. Those mushrooms are poisonous. Don't eat them, right? So that's a, that would be an example. Um, you know, positive politeness. Uh, there's some uh, mitigation uh, here, uh, where you would say something like, uh, you know, a nice. Um, uh, uh, you know, table and, uh, you know, silverware and everything is a wonderful meal, but I wouldn't eat the mushrooms because they're poisonous, right? So you've, you've said something good. Uh, you probably heard of this and they say, whenever you have to criticize somebody, do the sandwich approach where you say a good thing about them, then the bad thing, and then a good thing so that, that, that they, you don't end or begin on a bad thing. Uh, apparently that's supposed to be good managerial uh, style. Uh, I call it being a wuss, but okay, that's me. Um, <clears throat> negative politeness uh, is, you know, we've, we've talked about this, is, is indirectness, offer ways out, you know. So, so if you needed somebody to take you to Dallas, you'd say, would you mind taking me to Dallas? Uh, but, you know, if you, if you can't do it, I'll just take an Uber, don't worry, right? So, so you offer the person a way out, okay? Um, or, or you do what I do when I when I have to talk to Dr. Pickering. I say, don't get angry right away. And then, you know, that way she she, she then has to wait a little bit before she hits me with the, with a two by four. Um, and by the way, the woman has some serious, uh, all right, I'm joking. She does not hit me with a two by four. It's a much larger piece of, of wood, of course. Our, our, it's a very old joke. Um, <clears throat> Uh, an even more uh, mitigated thing is not to say it explicitly, right? So, so you let the, the hearer figure it out, right? So you say, oh, it'd be really lovely if we could go to Dallas tomorrow. You know, I hear, um, you know, there's a new store that I've opened. And, you know, I, I always feel like taking a stroll in downtown Dallas. Um, you know, uh, I need a little bit of urban life and, you know, and you don't. You never said, "Please take me to Dallas," right? But you kind of like made made it clear that that's what uh, what you wanted to do. And then fi finally, the most extreme uh, 
politeness strategy is just not to do the face threatening act at all. Just just don't do it. Right? Just say, I'm not going to Dallas anyway, so forget it. Then just just don't don't even ask to be taken to Dallas, right? That's extreme because you if you wanted to, if you if you had a reason to do the face threatening act, you give up on your reason so as not to upset the, the hearer. Uh, so here you have a chart that's also going to be in the in the book chapter that that summarizes what I just said. So you can uh, you can look at it uh, at ease. And uh, finally, to conclude the the discussion, Brown and Levinson say that politeness is universal. In other words, that that uh, their account of politeness as a the rational uh, mitigation of uh, face threats uh, is universal. They say every culture does it. Now, when when you have a, a, a claim like this, you need to be careful because, I mean, obviously, um, it's clear that politeness is not the same in, in every country, right? Uh, so I can give you an example of a cross-cultural difference in politeness, which I may have used uh, before. Uh, in Italy, when somebody offers you food at the table, uh, you're supposed to refuse three times, and then you accept, right? So, so let's say that that you know I, I'm eating with you. You made the cake, and you would say, "Sal, would you like some cake?" I said, "No, thank you." No, no, really. Would you like some cake? No, no, no. I said, "Please have some cake." No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Do me as a personal favor. Please have some cake. Okay. Here, give me a slice this big. Okay, that's the way it works uh, in Italy. Now, in this country, if somebody, if you say, Sal, would you like some cake? The answer is sure, right? If you say, no, thank you, they say, okay, guys have the cake. And you're like, ah, no, I wanted the cake, right? So obviously there's cross-cultural differences, right? That is, and, and um, you know, in this case, it's an, it, it's an intercultural difference because in my example, I, an Italian, and having dinner with an American, right? And so our styles of offering and refusing clash, right? Because in Italy, you refuse three times before accepting. In the US, you accept right away if you want it and you refuse and, and you offer only once, right? So, so obviously there are surface differences like this, but, but the behavior of offering and either accepting or refusing is the same, right? So, so the example that I have in the slides is thanking, right? So in uh, India, people thank doing this gesture, this, right? The, the gesture for the, uh, that we use for praying in, in, in our culture. Um, in Western culture, you thank by, by shaking hands, right? That's one way of, uh, of thanking, right? You have the other, the other. So obviously the gesture for thanking is different, but the idea of thanking is the same. You did something good for me, so I express my gratitude to you, okay? Um, and indeed, research has shown that gratitude is universal, okay? But the behavior to demonstrate gratitude are gonna be different, right? So, so Brown and Levinson are not just saying that, um, um, are obviously not talking about the behaviors, right? Because those are clearly different. They're saying the underlying reasons for the behaviors, gratitude, for example, that's going to be universal, okay? Um, now, however, some people have disagreed with this and, and we'll look more about it in a, in a, few, in a few minutes. So, so to begin with, um, there are, uh, you know, obviously power differences. Now, it's clear that a powerful person gets more respect and, and care and uh, attention than a powerless person. Okay? And in some societies, there is a concept of ingratiation where you basically, the lower person has to try and make the, the, the higher person as happy as possible because the higher person has the power to just smite them essentially and uh, destroy them. And so, so you have to keep them happy, to, to keep the powerful person uh, happy. This is a, um, a very foreign con concept of politeness for Western uh, American, particularly uh, uh, society. Um, then there's other cultures such as Japan, for example, which have this idea of community-based 
uh, societies. And so you use honorifics to signal your position within the community vis-a-vis -vis your interlocutors, right? Um, whereas in, in Western American politeness, it's all about the individual. It's a rational choice. In, in Japan, it's not so much a rational choice, but it's what everybody does. It's part, it's, you're part of the community. So if you don't do it, you're putting yourself outside of the community. So people disagree uh, radically on this. Um, most people argue that there are different politeness systems, that they're just they're just different. They're just not uh, not the same. Um, and then and then other people like uh, uh, Jeffrey Leach, uh, the same guy that that did the book in in eighty three, uh, he argues that by using his maxims or 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 um, Ronald Levinson's maxim type thing, you can explain politeness in any in any culture. Okay. All right. So. Um, Here's an example of what uh, of what we're talking about. So forms of address, right? That's a very relational uh, kind of thing, you know, where you indicate your position in society, but also your, the position of power or solidarity, right? So you have, you know, in English, you have forms. Of, these are forms of address. Is how do you address somebody? So in English, you have two options, and that is to call somebody by their first name or their title and their last name. Okay, so it's either Sal or Dr. Atardo, or if I were not a, you know, a professor, you would say Mr. Atardo, right? So these are the two forms, right? Now, in French and in Italian and Spanish and so on, um, there are different pronouns to indicate this, right? So, so if you address me as tu in French, uh, you're using the familiar, like calling me Sal. If you address me as vous, then you're using the formal, like calling me Dr. Atardo, right? And uh, so, so this is very, very interesting because you signal your familiarity and your friendship by using the informal, the T pronoun, and it co co conversely, you indicate your distance and your lack of familiarity by using the V pronoun, okay? which is exactly the same thing, and you, I'm sure you will recognize the situation. When you were a kid, if your parents called you by your full name, you were in real trouble. As long as they called you by your first name, you were okay. The moment that they called you by your full name, you knew that you were in real trouble, right? That's because they, they introduced the distance, right? So why is my parent addressing me with distance? Uh-oh, I must have done something bad, right? So that's the, the situation. Now, in Japanese, you've got something fairly similar. And it, this is simplified, by the way, uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, you know, so you have a neutral uh, form, which is a tardo-san. Um, so you would address me as a tardo-san. That's formal, but, but basically neutral. Then you could address me as a tardo-sama, which would be very formal or would indicate that you consider me to be superior to you. Or you could address me in a friendly or lower status way, which would be a tardo kun, right? Which corresponds to addressing me by sal, right? As, as a form of address. Um, okay, so, so as you can see, you know, you can argue that it's different or it's the same, right? I mean, it basically comes down to, do you believe that the principles are the same across all cultures or that they are culture specific, right? Um, and so this is a good transition to the second wave politeness uh, uh, theories. So, so as I um, pointed out earlier, um, basically they, uh, this is a group of people that starting around uh, uh, the 1990s to the 20 of 2005, 2006, that, that period, maybe even 2008, um, they, um, basically criticized the classical theories of politeness on a number of grounds, which we're going to look at uh, now. So, so here I have a quote by Michael Hall, who is a, a, a great uh, young, well, yeah, great scholar. Um, he's not that young anymore, but, uh, but he's, he's done fantastic uh, work. Um, and by the way, he's coming to the Humor Conference in Austin uh, this summer. So if you want to meet him and see him speak, He's, a, he's an Australian uh, scholar, so he's not, he's not here very often. 
Um, you know, so he's talking about uh, this in an article that he wrote in 2007, and he says, the postmodern approach to politeness, which is the second wave theories are also known as postmodern or discursive uh, theories of politeness. So he says the postmodern approach to politeness um, abandons the pursuit of a predictive theory, um, and in fact, even of a descriptive theory, okay? So in other words, basically, they, the, the, the second wave says, you know what, we're not that interested in having a big overarching theory. We are more interested in looking at what people actually do in context. Um, another postmodern theory is a feminist critique of, of politeness, uh, which, uh, uh, if you're interested, you can read it, uh, was then heavily uh, criticized by Janet Holmes, who's one of the great uh, living scholars of sociolinguistics, who'd been working on politeness for years and years, and she did not take kindly to being told that her work was, was useless. And so she um, clapped back, as they say today. Um, so, so here's a, a, um, uh, another quote that, uh, that uh, expresses fairly clearly what I meant. It's the quote at the bottom there. Um, Watts, who is one of these uh, postmodern theorists, says, Politeness is an ultimately indefinable quality of interaction. So he basically gives up. He says, you can't define politeness, right? Uh, and basically, they just give up. They just say, you can't define politeness. Uh, so what, what should you do then if you're interested in politeness, right? I mean, that's a reasonable uh, question. So, so this is what they say. Uh, they say, well, we should shift our emphasis, our research on discourse in the terms of um, what Foucault uh, calls the social norms, norms that constitute reality. In other words, we should look at how, is, how are the, the norms of society uh, responsible for the way we look at reality, right? Um, they say, so we should use interactional data, we should use real conversation, not made up examples, because, uh, you know, the, the Brown and Levinson leech and even Robin Lakoff examples, most of, a lot of them were, were made up. Not all, but, but, a, but a majority. Um, we should emphasize the assessment of the speakers involved in the exchange, uh, not just have our own. Um, in, other, in other words, you know, ask the speaker, how did they feel? Did that feel polite? Did that feel uh, impolite? Um, shift on the relationship among the speakers. Um, because, because basically there's a, a, a number of scholars that said, um, you know, it's not really about politeness or just about politeness. It is, uh, is about making people feel good or feel bad. And politeness is just one strategy within this overall idea of making people feel good, good or bad. Um, they basically say, well, face does not exhaust politeness. There's, there's more to politeness than face. Because remember, Brown and Levinson say face work is politeness. Right? So here they're saying, yeah, face work is politeness, but there's politeness that's not face work. Okay? Uh, and that is a valid, uh, valid uh, point. Uh, and then they criticize the Gricean Serland Speech Act uh, um, rationality uh, kind of thing. Again, because the, it focuses too much on the speaker's intention, and they say we should look at, at, the, at the evaluation. Uh, because of the artificial example, because it's based on this individualistic definition of, of, of the action, right? It's the individual single speaker that makes the decision, right? Um, and it, they say this is Eurocentric because in other cultures, such as Japanese, Chinese, etc., it's more of a community-based uh, thing, so Confucian uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, and finally, they strongly reject the idea of universalism, that is, that, uh, that, that the politeness theory in the Brown and Levinson model applies universally across the board to every, to every culture. They say, that's just, just, that's just not right. All right. So, so as you can see, it's a pretty strong uh, criticism. Um, and to be fair, to be fair, um, 
some of the criticism is, is quite on target, okay? So for example, that face does not exhaust politeness. That's unquestionably true. Remember, I said at the beginning of my lecture, there's plenty of politeness that's not even linguistic, okay? So it doesn't necessarily have to do with, uh, with face, uh, right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that you can do um, that, that don't have to do necessarily with face. Um, you know, other criticisms seem petty, uh, like for example, the decontextualized examples. Uh, you can always find examples for whatever you want. All you need to do is look. Um, you know, you will find that uh, in the uh, chapter of the book that, that, I'm, that I'm writing, that we're writing on this, um, I went and found examples in a big corpus, you know, whatever I need, I go find an example and I put it in the book. So what's the difference between me making it up and me looking up for an example? It just takes me 15 minutes longer to find an example, maybe a half an hour, right? But obviously the, the examples that I make up aren't going to be that different from the reality because otherwise you would say, well, that makes no sense. Nobody behaves like this, right? So there is, a, there is an inherent plausibility to the made up examples that otherwise you're going to reject, right? Um, and then the universalism thing, yeah, that's actually a real question. It's not clear whether politeness is universal or not. And, and that is an open, an open question. There is another criticism that I forgot to put on this, so please make a note of it, is that um, they also criticize the classical models because they don't deal with impoliteness. Right? They say, you all talk about politeness all the time, but they, you don't talk about impoliteness in and of its own. Because in being impolite is not just not being polite. Okay, so, and we'll see in a second, um, uh, some people pick it up. All right, so as I said, 1990s to about 2005, 2006, um, and then a third wave um, uh, hits. Um, and basically, it's kind of a synthesis of the first and the second wave, um, you know, based on, on discourse ideas like co-construction, um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, social practices, uh, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, looking at um, uh, discourse analysis, uh, ethnomethodology, methodology, which is the, the um, uh, Del Himes and, and um, uh, Scherzer and these, these guys, you know, so in other words, looking at, in an anthropological way at what happens in the, the conversations and in the, in the exchanges, you know, the whole discursive approaches uh, to politeness, you know. So, so all of this um, is a synthesis on the one hand of what the second wave politeness were saying, there's not enough of, but also while still adopting and still using uh, the, the, the Gricean, Brown and Levinson, Maxim uh, kind of model. And then the other thing that they, that they introduce is this idea of conventionalization, uh, of ritualization. And we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about that uh, in a second. But one of the things that the third wave politeness theories do is they take on very, very seriously impoliteness. And one of the biggest names uh, on the topic is, is Jonathan Culpepper, um, who... Um, has written a bunch of stuff. He, he's one of the biggest uh, uh, scholars uh, on, on the subject. So, um, you know, he, and the idea is that quite simply, um, impoliteness is not just not being polite. You actually have to get out of your way to be impolite. And so, so there's ways of doing that. And we're not going to go into, into it uh, during the lecture, but you'll find a little bit more about it in the, in the chapter. Uh, when I uh, when I get around to to, to publish now, here's the the thing that I want to focus on: this idea of politeness as ritual. Okay, so first of all, what is a ritual? Let's do a little, you know teeny tiny bit of anthropology here. A ritual is a solemn ceremony, possibly religious, which consists of a series of actions prescribed that are performed in a prescribed order. 
right? So, so if you're Catholic, you know, you go to Mass, you know that first there is the blessing, then there is the communion, then there is blah, 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 right? So there is a, a set of things in, in a certain order. Or if you have to cross yourself, you go like this and you do, there's a certain order to the gestures on, on how to do it. So Terkurafi, who, who is um, uh, one of the big names in, in, this, uh, in this idea of politeness as, as ritual, uh, she says, so um, basically what ritual does is it, it reduces the complexity of the everyday life of, of, of you know, encounters between people, for example, to a habitual structure, right? So every time that you meet somebody new, you have to greet them, right? So if you had to invent a way of greeting people every time that you meet a new person, you'd run out of ideas real quick. But if you have a set way of greeting people who, when you meet them, such as, for example, saying, nice to meet you, then it becomes a ritual. So you know that you're going to say, nice to meet you. The other person says, nice to, nice to meet you too. You say, how are you? You say, how are you? And, you know, you then go your merry way. And that's the end of the problem, right? So problem solved, um, you have... Uh, a stereotypical, con conventionalized, habitual uh, structure to do things, and that works, right? And the, so that gives you uh, your 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 uh, politeness. And one way that this is uh, that this is done is by using recurring formulae, which are like phraseological units, idioms. Uh, you know, so things like greeting, thanking, excusing. So you, when you have to, you're doing something that's annoying. You're going to excuse yourself. You say excuse me, or I'm sorry, right? And so, and these are standard uh, uh, expressions. If you use a different expression, um, you know, it, it wouldn't work as well. It would, it would be marked and you would have to explain what you're doing. The same thing goes for, um, you know, opening, closing, dismissing class, all of these things, there's ways of doing it that uh, because they're formulae, because they're ritualized, they help smooth uh, things things around. And so here's a, here's a, um, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more on this. So Terkurafi in a fairly recent uh, uh, article uh, says that basically being polite is displaying the familiarity that one has with the norms uh, of the exchange, right? So, um, you know, con conventionalized expressions uh, are used regardless of everything else because that's the way you do it, right? And so in order to, to apologize, you have to apologize. So if something happened wrong, you say, my bad, right? And that is an apology and everybody knows that because you're using the conventionalized form of the apology, right? And so again, that's what makes it polite is that you're conforming to the norm of the exchange of the society that, that both of you, speaker and here, are, are familiar with, right? So here, um, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a, a French um, a sociologist, comes in with the concept of habitus. Uh, it's like habit, but with uh, the Latin ending. And basically, that's ways in which society has inculcated in you a way of doing something, okay? So, for example, we've been inculcated, I mean, like literally, sort of be, it's been beating uh, into us that, uh, you know, you don't eat with your fingers something like pasta, right? And so it would be horribly rude in Italy to eat with your fingers, right? Now, let's not get complicated that there are situations where that's acceptable, okay? But, but forget that. Um, years ago, I, I organized a conference and uh, at the banquet, I mean, not the banquet, the, the, the opening reception, we decided that we were going to serve wings, right? It's a great idea, you know, it's like wings, beer. It was, it, was a, it was a great idea. Except what we had not figured out is that half of the conference attendees were foreigners. And so when they stood there and they were looking for plates and forks and um, that sort of thing, and of course, there were no forks, because it was wings and you eat wings with your fingers. So I realized what was going on because they were all standing there. So I, I 
demanded silence. I took one wing and I said, watch me. And I proceeded to eat the wing with my fingers. And then I wiped my fingers and I said, that's how you eat wings in this country. And then, you know, they all went and ate because they, they had been absolved from the non-ritualistic way of eating the food, right? So that's the point of, of ritual. It gives you a given way, a standardized way of, of doing this. So, um, and, uh, you know, so there's a good example there that uh, it's this article by Mainz and Walson uh, that shows um, uh, with data from, from American English um, that um, um, when you want to say that something looks good, looks nice, um, you use for 50% of the data, so a remarkably large number of, of uh, you use only five adjectives and two verbs. Okay, so in other words, complimenting something is done by using I like or I love, and it's nice, it's good, it's beautiful, it's pretty, and it's great. These seven words account for 50% of the data, right? So, um, you know, it's kind of like an impressive number. Again, 50% of all comments about, uh, you know, the, the quality of something is done with five adjectives. That's just, uh, that, just uh, that just is remarkable. Uh, another point that Ter Rafi does in, in, in showing that, um, that politeness is conventionalized is that offensive gestures are conventionalized as well. You're all familiar with giving the finger, right? So I'm not gonna have, I don't have to demonstrate that. But let me tell you a funny story. When I first came to this country, um, I saw the Rosie the Riveteer um, poster where you have the, you know, the, this good looking woman that's rolling up her sleeves and uh, said, we can do it. And she has, she's doing it in this position. Now in Italy, this gesture is the exact equivalent of giving the finger to that it is in America, right? So when I saw the Rosie the Riveteer poster, I fell over laughing because I was like, whoa, that's, that's not good. So I had this poster above my, uh, my desk and everybody was like, oh, you are <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> there was a cultural difference there, okay? So, but, but that's, what, that's what it shows that they're conventionalized, right? So there is nothing about this gesture in itself that is rude, okay? And you can test with, with other gestures. So apparently in some countries, this gesture here to, to do a ring with your finger is horribly rude. Uh, I think in Brazil, I think I was told. Anyway, that's, that's my point. In England, this is rude, but this is not. You know, because it's conventionalized, right? It's conventional. It's not a um, necessary uh, 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 thing. Okay, so finally, um, let's uh, wrap up with uh, Der Kurafi's view. So, so you may say, okay, now this is really a criticism of the Brown and Levinson approach um, because Brown and Levinson see politeness as indirectness, whereas Der Kurafi sees it as conventionalization, right? So you have these formulas that you use not because they're more indirect, just because they're conventional, right? Now, except that, of course, um, indirectness is itself conventionalized, okay? So you say, would you mind? Could I trouble you? If it's not too much, asking for too much, right? And so, so these expressions that are um, indirect have been conventionalized into expressions of uh, apology, requesting, uh, politely requesting and, and so on, right? So it's not necessarily um, antagonistic, but um, you know, it certainly re represents a different way of looking at uh, uh, politeness. And then uh, she concludes with a, with a very, very good reminder, uh, which is that um, politeness and impoliteness are always emotionally invested. It's never a cold judgment where you, or, you, know, where you say, oh, you know, this is clearly polite or this is clearly uh, impolite. There's always an emotional judgment. It's polite if it makes you feel better. It's impolite if it makes you feel, feel worse, right? And so that's, that's an important thing that uh, uh, we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with politeness. 
All right, so wrapping up uh, uh, the lecture, three ways. The classical theories of uh, politeness, Brown and Levinson being the most um, uh, important one, based on the rational Gricean cooperative um, uh, speaker who decides to lower the threat of the face threatening acts by using indirectness. The second wave, the discursive postmodern approaches, reject um, the classical theories because they say, A, they don't pay enough attention to the discourse, to the motivations of the speakers, to the interplay of the speakers. Uh, they don't pay enough attention to the reaction of the speakers, to the evaluation and the assessment that the speakers themselves do of the, of the situation. And they have this universality assumption, which they reject completely. And they say they also are limited because they only look at some aspects of politeness, namely face, and they don't look at other things such as, for example, non-face related politeness, and uh, they also don't look at impoliteness. So the third wave theories look at impoliteness, for example, the work by, by Culpepper. Um, they also look at, they use discursive data, you know, Hall, uh, Terkurafi, so they, they look at real uh, data. Um, and they start looking at politeness as conventional, as ritual. And they see, they see the value of politeness in this enactment of ritualistic uh, practices that allow us to, um, to sort of function in, in interaction without sort of killing each other. Uh, but but uh, you know, by, by using these, these rituals, we sort of manage the trouble of, of living socially. Okay, so that, that uh, wraps up uh, uh, the, um, the, the discussion. Um, any questions? No, very good. All right, so then um, I'm going to stop uh, the, the lecture uh, here. As usual, you can email me if you have any questions. And uh, um, all right, bye.